Hey, what's up, guys? We've got an amazing podcast with Ricardo Zoidel, two-time Austrian national champion. The conversation got going really quickly into training, and I, I was a little uh, a fanboy to be talking to such a ridiculously amazing cyclist. Shout out to our new coach, Alex Sankovic, which we haven't really announced him yet. He's on our Zwift racing team, but he's been the guy behind getting a lot of these insanely high level athletes to come and talk to us and share their experience. I'm going to chop this into two episodes to make it a little bit more digestible, but straight out the gate, we start talking about how Ricardo made it to the world tour without a coach and then what it was like training without structure and then with structure and then too much structure and understanding how your body feels. And it all circled back to the importance of endurance rides and fat max rides, which he explains is more towards just about hitting that low tempo zone. And then he pushed a little bit too much and we'll go into what happens, what, what happened to him when that happened. Um, some high torque work. And then we talk on the lactate equation, your building rates, but also lactate clearance and some of the things he does for his pre-race, uh, like before the season starts workouts to really make sure he's fine tuned and ready to go. So enjoy this amazing first podcast with Ricardo. The second one will drop shortly after that. And I think this will help us hone in on, you know, really dig into some of these topics as opposed to having a full long hour. So enjoy. Love to hear your feedback in the comments below. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave a review and hit us up if you want to have a power file analysis done for free where we look through your power files to help give you some tips that you can optimize your training and take it on your way and become a faster cyclist. Thanks so much. And Ricardo, thank you, man. This was incredible. Living the pro cyclist life. Uh, now I'm more a dead life, not a, a cyclist so much. But, so, uh, uh, but you're still racing, right? Of course, yeah. No, it's... it's Still, because but in, in, in last year November I got I got twins, so it's a little bit challenging. But uh, now it's okay. I'm still still racing and motivating. Yeah. Congrats, man! That's awesome. Thank you. You know, if you can just share your experience, it'll help so many people, and I really appreciate you. Yeah, doing of course, yeah. Cool. So I used to say this is the easiest question, but it's become the hardest question. Uh, and tell me if I pronounce your last name incorrectly. Who is Ricardo Zoidel? That's correct, yeah. Perfect. I'm 32 years old. I'm getting 30, 33 this, this year. And uh, yeah, actually, I started 2003 with uh, cycling. I was 14 years old. Before, I was a good runner. and uh, But then I like more the training uh, in cycling. And step by step, uh, yeah, I was, I was okay in, in, in the juniors, but that not really... Not really special. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, when when I came first in the under twenty three or elite, I had really big troubles the, the first two years to yeah to to be competitive. Even to finish a race was was hard. Especially at that time, I think it was not so clean. Also, but they also a factor, but. When I see also my my data from from that time was was not good enough. Uh, so, mm-hmm. but then from 2009 on, uh, there was a big turning point uh, where it gets better, better, better. Yeah, and then in 2012-13, I had uh, one of my best seasons, and then obviously I get the the con uh, the contract uh, with Trek. Yeah, and so that was my my journey. Uh, and the pro pilot one, yes. Incredible. So let me. So would you say then from, and so for people who are like, that haven't Googled Ricardo yet, you know, he's been racing, pro racing for 15 plus years now. It sounds like from coming from U23, would you say from like when you seriously started training that it took you five or six years to like, just get your legs to really feel like when you're looking back now and you're like, Hey, I just wasn't good enough. You know, when do you feel like you first started being like, okay, I'm getting pretty good at this? Like how many years in of actual training? And the reason I ask you this question is we're in a culture now where everybody wants to ride Zwift for 12 to 18 months. And if they're not where they want to be, they're like, ah, I'm just not good enough. And I'm like, 
you're you're like scratching the surface here like how long do you think it took you to really get in get into it uh my, my first year in the league was 2007 so mm -hmm. actually from that the because everything you do in the juniors it doesn't count so it's from that is a new starting point and then it took me yeah 2011 when i won the first uh it was on the uci uh, europe tour it's like the, the continental team mm -hmm. i won one one stage in a stage race but i have to say i never had in my life a coach so until i get uh, in the world tour, i never had a coach so i always uh i always say to some people if i if i knew all the knowledge that i have now maybe i would be earlier okay because i had no structure and no nothing i just i just go for rides okay i do some hard intervals or this or that but no structure and I, I didn't know nothing so but, but then, this is so, while you're a pro yes maybe but maybe if i knew that before when i was young if i had a really good coach or something maybe i could go maybe three years earlier to be that successful but okay it was a good a good uh, learning process and but then from 2012, um, I get a, a teammate. He was also in a, in a pro tour, and he gave me some tips. And uh, yeah, first he started to me, hey, you, you look like a bodybuilder because I was a little bit more muscle. And what are you doing? You have to lose weight. And then I start to lose a little bit weight. And he gave me some tips. And then I got really into the, into the training, and uh, I did a lot of research on the internet, try this, try that. And so step by step was what was getting uh, I was getting closer and better to to win races. And then in 2012, I really start the season really well. Uh, I, I dominated in, in Austria every every race. And uh, then from 2012 to 13, I say, okay, I want to I want to be good in two of Austria because two of Austria is like two of California in, in the US. Mm -hmm. So if you win that or you have a good result, you're you can maybe have a contract. Then I started really preparing for this event. And then I had the best season uh, ever, actually. <laughs> I had so much, so many wins, even on flat races. So that was, was nice to, to see that process. And so, so just to clarify, so you made it, you didn't get your coach until you went to track? Yes, I, because in track, or if you're in the world, you have to have a coach from the team. Okay. So, but when I when I come back from track, I also did by myself. I always because uh, I knew what I had to do and I had good feeling with my body. So that was uh, was was good. But also in track, I, I learned a lot from the coaches and some new techniques. So yeah. But from from the point, yeah, when I go to track, I never had a coach in my life. Never. That's so was that what made you not want to coach? Actually, in, in Austria, it's quite difficult to find a good coach. Uh, there was the national coach was just a, a taxi driver. I mean, we went to the races, but he, he never coached somebody. Mm -hmm. So we had not really good people. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after when I went to track, we had a, a good training group here. Uh, also now Felix Koschart, Nathan Bora, and uh, Michael Gogol in uh, Quebec. So we have a lot of people that are in the world now. So we make, when we go training, we say, okay, maybe you try this, you try that. So that it starts that uh, maybe the Austrian get a little bit better because we discuss the, uh, in between the riders, what, what's good, what's bad, what can we do. Mm -hmm. But um, we have never really in Austria not, uh, with people for coaching that's what that's really interesting i coached a guy in germany um who did uh i guess it's not it's some rad marathon which i guess means grand fondo over there if i'm correct but yeah. he said um he's like man it's really weird like most people don't get coaches over here it's just not like the u.s culture where like you go online and you find somebody to coach you and so it's been interesting like i'll, I'll talk to different people from over there and they're like their friends don't get coaches and so it's just uh it's very interesting to hear that side of things when you're talking about like you guys would talk amongst your friends of what to do 
or like what's working, what's not working. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, how did you, besides you mentioned like what your body felt like when you were a newer cyclist in those first five years, even though, I mean, you're still racing, I, I say newer, but you're still a continental pro. How did you know what you should do? Were you just like, cause it's hard when you're just in there every day, like I should go hard or I should do threshold stuff or I should do VO two max or, or was it more like terrain? Like today I'm going to ride rollers and go fast. And today I'm going to go climb. And how did you kind of navigate that? Or was it just wake up and ride? I mean, before it was just riding. You heard, okay, you do, it was like do five minutes full gas up the climb. Mm -hmm. that. And then I get, then I, I just say, okay, I want to go. Okay. At that point it was pretty naive because I didn't know that because I just say, okay, I want to go as fast as possible that I'm, for example, in a race, if there's a good speed, it doesn't hurt me. So I went a lot of time. In the end was, now you can call it fat neck, was more or less uh, a lot of this. And that was basically all I did. Sometimes I do 40, 20s, but I didn't know anything. So I, mm -hmm. I just step by step, then I hear some new, okay, I tried this. Then uh, we do a lot of, also then in the, in the world, we do a lot of uh, strength efforts. We do uh, uh, a lot. But then step by step, it comes this, that, and so, and then suddenly it works. I got, I got better. And then also in the continental level, it was nice because every weekend you had to have races. Mm -hmm. So in the end, between the, in between the, uh, the weekends, I just do endurance or fat max at that time. Mm -hmm. when, I didn't know that it was fat max. I just went. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was 270 to 80 watts. Just and then on the on the weekend you had the intensity, and that was it. Was it? And then when I came to track, it was more really scientific, and uh, <laughs> yeah. it was actually sometimes too much because he he wrote so much exercises. Or um, I, for for example, I never did an interval two times. Because always different variations, different minutes, sitting, standing was actually too much for us. It was nice because it was um, quite entertaining. But then when I was in track, it would get really scientific, and then I understand more and more maybe what I did in the past. So for people listening here, and you talk about fat max, so like two sixty, so that's like four hundred ish FTP. Is that how you base it off of? Well, but my FTP is between uh, depends. Just so you know, so when you say fat max, you mean like middle endurance zone? No, oh, it's really the upper one. Really oh, where okay. you get close to zone three. Okay. Okay. Um, and the, uh, the funny thing is I come back now to this because in track we did uh, a lot of tempo work. Mm -hmm. And the problem with tempo work was at that time that I was, I was too ambitious. So I was always pushing too much. I always did. If he were all three intervals, it is five or six. Mm -hmm. So in the end, it killed me always. But if you do it smart, it, 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 it's a nice way to, to, to train. But for me, the fat max is, I really like it because uh, I felt I get really, really fast. And uh, I watch also now the, the train of uh, Pogacar. He's okay. also the, in Igos on Milan. He's also, he lives in the US. Okay. And he's also a big fan of, of, of this training. And, uh, he explained it and now everything is uh, come back together why it's really so good for me. So. Which is so interesting because like, I don't know, four or five years ago, everyone's like, tempo is no man's land. You get nothing good from that. And I'm like, tempo's great endurance work. Like it's, you can't do it all the time. Like you said, like you do it too much and down the road, it's just too much. It's like a, it's a slow killer of you. But dosed at the right time i think it's great and you look even at a bike race like there's a lot of tempo time um so go ride get some kjs in and then do like intervals at the end to simulate the end of a race i think it's a great workout some people disagree because it's not like physiologically proven but i don't know i think it's proven by real life <laughs> it's it's very applicable to well, i think the 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 good thing with this tempo effort in combination with the uh, strength effort so with low rpm mm -hmm. is that uh, you bring down your lactate building rate so you actually you, you when the lactate building rate goes down also your threshold goes down if the vo2 max stays the same 
So that's also a nice way to, to combine this, these two trainings. But for me, I think it depends really on the right dose. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I was really surprised also in track how less we do. Because we do sometimes two times 12 minutes finish. And I would say, what, well, that's all? Or the tempo. Yeah, wow. that's all. Uh, when, I, when I came first in the training camp in December, I was shocked. I was really shocked because we do in the group three hours, four hours rest day. And we do maybe two times 10 minutes strength efforts going home. So really no crazy because in the amateur scene, you hear or also on the internet, you have to do three by 30 minutes. And, and I was also thinking that. But then I came here and I say, why are you doing so less? And say, hey, oh, easy, easy, easy. They always go on the breaks. It's like, it, it, it was funny that they actually doing pretty less. And, he, and my trainer say, okay, if you do 30 to 40 minutes, it's enough. Mm -hmm. Especially in the preseason, it, it's okay. Sometimes before the races, we do some really extreme sessions. We also did three times 30 minutes, but for, I don't know, November, December, January, we take it quite, quite easy. And uh, yeah, that's, I think also the mistakes of the amateurs, they, they push too fast. They, they go, because sometimes you, you don't need so much. Right. <laughs> I was going to say like for amateurs, for the person like Joey, who's getting out of work, he just worked eight hours and he gets out and he wants to go train to go ride endurance, he's going to be like, this is boring. And, you know, someone had made the comment before, like cycling training sometimes is kind of boring. Like you just go out and ride, make sure you're pedaling the bike. Don't coast for half of the ride, but you're not doing crazy sprints and threshold intervals every single time. You only need two of those a week, really. Um, I think that is a, a downfall for some amateurs. It's just embracing the, the, casualness that a big training schedule really provides at times yes and of course okay as a pro you, you train more hours so you cannot do really the same uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh intensity uh with a minute or hour wise so but you can do also a threshold session in, in december but you can make it quite easy we do sometimes i don't know one minute threshold 30 seconds easy Mm -hmm. In the end, okay, the average bar is not the same, but your heart rate stayed almost like threshold, and it's a nice way to start. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can build more to more steady to eight minutes, ten minutes. But it was also nice that we start really, really progressively easy with the effort. And sometimes you think, hey, it's a joke, this, this effort. But actually, it was also nice to the, for the body to, to really start slowly, and then you actually see the, the same benefit uh when you do for example three times 10 minutes threshold or you do it one 60 seconds 30 seconds off and you do it 10 minutes so it was actually actually nice yeah you make me feel good because i have athletes that here in the u.s a lot of people they'll kind of go through like a base period starting maybe like october november depending on where they live and when racing is going to start in february march april and I'll give them like three by eight tempo, <clears throat> excuse me. And they're like, this is so easy. And I'm like, you don't have to kill yourself. You're not racing for another five months. Like, let's do this in a progressive manner. And I'll show them sometimes like, this is kind of, we're going to go through the next three to four months. Um, you know, I have people in the gym, I believe in gym work. And I said, that's a big focus. Like, you don't need to be killing yourself right now. That's not going to make you faster in the long term. It might make you faster for December, but you're not racing in December. And it's really, it's hard sometimes to split the bike racing versus the, you know, a type personality. I want to work hard. I want to achieve. And I want to get that win in this workout. And it's like, the win is going to be very easy. Go lift weights and go ride three by eight minute tempo. So you make me feel better hearing that. Cause sometimes I'm like, God, am I, am I being too easy on these people? But it's really, it helps them. And I think also getting those mental wins, like, cool, did that. Cool. Did that. Like nobody wants to be losing in November, like banging their head on the wall, doing hard intervals. It just doesn't make sense. And, um, and also you, you don't need to kill yourself in every training. Mm. It's, 
it's 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 more important to be consistent. And uh, for example, this year I tried a new approach. I went from the same bond really a bio to max Kuka. I wanted I wanted to try, but I really start easy. I do three times six minutes thirty thirty. Mm-hmm. So really not crazy numbers, and then I build it up. I build it up. So. But in the end, three times six minutes, 30, 30, I do, I don't know, three eight here because I was so bad at that time. So, but you don't feel so much hard that the training was so hard. So then you build up, you build up, but that's, that's the key because if you, if you come to, if you start too early after the off season, after 10 days or 14 days, you get the bill for mm-hmm. sure. If you start also with the hours, Mm-hmm. It's better you start really easy, and then if you have some level, you can go really, you can go really hard, no problem. But just to keep the body the time to 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 adapt. When you were talking about the low cadence or the high torque, and uh, you know if you're keeping your VO2 max the same um, because of the lactate, you can actually push your FTP down as opposed to bringing it up. Do you ever do over unders um, where you're creating lactate and then working on like clearing lactate? So let's say it's nothing, not having to go crazy high over like 110% and then lower into tempo. I've, you know, there's a, some blogs out there and stuff talking about that really can help you work on that equation of balancing the lactate. Um, so make it and then have your body clear it. Do you ever, have you ever done those or found benefit from that type of thing? uh yes i i do i start let me say another way that came the 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 fat max string because the fat max string it stimulates the mitochondria Mm -hmm. so in in the mitochondria you you when you build lactate in the fast switch fibers Mm -hmm. it comes to the slow switch where the mitochondria and you can use it for energy Mm -hmm. and also your lactate level doesn't rise up in the blood if you have good mm-hmm. mitochondria. So a lot of fat max, it's, it's, it's good. So then if you have a good uh, mitochondria, a good base, then I do, I start with, I do, I start maybe, yeah, with fat max and then I do, I don't know, every, every two minutes, something like 20, 20 seconds acceleration. And then I build it up, for example, before the races, I really do, uh, over under uh, maybe one one minute or mm-hmm. I go one minute really really deep to build really black center and then I go three minutes a little bit a little bit below threshold and then go back again but this I do more before the races but uh, when I start I do a lot of this short acceleration but at max or low or low tempo not, mm-hmm. not really that is not really taxing but I try to do the 15 or 20 seconds really 500 really uh, really good and then come straight back to and you can for example in the beginning you can do it every three or four minutes it's, it's more easy and then if you come more to the races you can do every minute or every two minutes mm-hmm. so that then it's more challenging and the heart rate will stay really high even if you go low tempo your heart rate will be super high fun. it's cr- fun. yeah fun, yeah it's so these are so I started working with um you know there's three of us and and Alex is coming on as a coach there's four of us coaching and I was kind of looking around for a, a coach I like having a coach and sometimes people are like you're a coach why do you need a coach and I think it's just good to have somebody to talk to and um I was looking for somebody that was outside the U.S. and just kind of a little bit different type of a rider than me and I started working with Tom Bell mountain biker from the UK is very into the physiology. And I'm like, I was reading some of his blogs and we kind of chatted and I'm like, this guy would be perfect because he sees things from a different lens. And um, he's big into like, he was really breaking down in simpler terms. He was breaking down the mitochondria aspect of VO2 max, which I never really thought of it this way of you have to do those endurance rides. You have enough mitochondria to deal with the work that the hard efforts you know the oxygenated blood that you bring down to the mitochondria if they can't there's not enough of them and they can't have enough of being like the powerhouse of the cell to work properly it doesn't matter how hard you're going you're the whole equation doesn't work well and I think it's really good that you bring that up because it's like everybody wants to go hard thinking that those are the only things you need to do to get 
a higher VO2 max or really be able to race at the hard parts of the race. But just like you're saying, like you got to do the fat max endurance ride so that you can, you have the full equation. Like you can't do one or just the other. It's the whole thing. Um, yeah, because normally everybody looks at VO2 max or the lactate building rate, but actually you have to look at the, the lactate clearance, mm -hmm. how you can clear lactate. Mm -hmm. And that you can do only uh, in the mitochondria. And that you, the most stimulus is when you go fat max. But you have to look which muscle fibers you have. Because if you are more fast twitch, you don't have so much slow twitch. So then you don't have so much mitochondria that you can really, and that's also the point that everybody has a different talent. And everybody has to know it if he's talented or not. Because sometimes also in coaching, I you do the same program for this and that rider, but in the end they go in completely different different ways. And some of them are really frustrated because hey, I'm doing so much. Uh, why, why, why? And they don't have an answer. And sometimes you think I think you have to tell them, okay, maybe you're not the gifted rider, but try to maximum the 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 training for yourself and make the maximum for you. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think you have to tell also the athletes because sometimes I have a lot of friends, they, they're, not, they're not talented. And they, they're really, they're always asking me, hey, how you train, how you train, I say, I do this, do that. But then you can see that, okay, he has not really the talent, but then I tell, tell them, okay, because you like it, do it the best you can. And then what, what it comes out, it comes out. So, uh, you cannot compare uh, you with, I don't know, Chris Froome or this rider. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. Or everybody adapts different to training. That's also really uh, important. That's, uh, yeah, you have to be, you have to be aware and also keep it that in mind. Uh, it is very interesting of like, you know, man you make a lot of great points in that statement it's um it's funny when two athletes do want to compare their schedule or they want to compare like why does why does that workout seem to work better for me or like why does this person do that workout more often and it's just like you gotta figure out what you respond to and what what's really making you ready on race day stay tuned for part two coming soon with ricardo zoidal two-time austrian national champion just incredible, man.